Hello everyone. It is November 19th, 2024. It's Tuesday. It's Harp Tuesday. Welcome to this week's episode. It's It's been quite a while, but I'm finally back from my European tour and looking forward to doing some Harp Tuesday episodes. Uh, and so today, today on, a, on a wild and windy Tuesday evening, I'm going to be, in a sense, revisiting the very first episode I ever did, which was on Ceremony of Carols. So yeah, 14 years ago, I uploaded episode one of Harp Tuesday, which was an in-depth look at Britain's Ceremony of Carols. But today, what I want to do is I want to just look at a couple sections in there that where I have made, I think, improvements to how I approached that maybe 10 years ago uh, or 14 years ago. So again, I think when you're playing something over the years and over the decades, it's always worth experimenting and coming up with, oh, wait a minute, maybe there's a slightly better fingering I can use here or a slightly better approach or this hand could take that note instead of this hand that maybe makes it easier or sound better. And it's fun, right? Solving problems. And it's something I enjoy and uh, sort of having a piece evolve over the years to get maybe closer and closer to the, the easiest way or the best way to play it. And when I say best, I mean for me, right? Because so if I come up with a solution that's better, it might be better in general, it might be better for most people, or it might be just better for me with my hands and my technique and, and not necessarily applicable to everyone. But yeah, I think it's a really nice thing to do and a fun thing to do. And I wanted to share with you a couple of these spots. And actually, I'm going to start by sharing something that I just thought of today and that inspired me to do this episode. So yeah, I'm working on this piece again. I'm playing it again in December, of course, and, and uh, I'm looking at the second piece, the Welcome Yule, this. That pretty soon gets this little pattern going along in the right hand. a couple of buzzes there which is not not necessarily surprising because we're kind of fighting over the same notes so for example this a that the left hand's playing is the top of this d chord this a right here is the same a we've just played right here in the right hand and it's the same a here then we're, the left hand's going to play this a which is the same a that we've just played right here so that when we go like this, uh, of course, slow is not so bad, but it's it's we just really have to delay the thumb. And so today I was ah, I want to work on this a little bit. I want to try and get this better, right? And in particular, then I was struck by why is it that this that D chord is worse than the A chord? And of course, it's because, oh, wait a minute, this F. This F, this last note we, that we play in the previous bar, this one right here, is the same note we have to play then in the left hand and for that chord. And of course, there's a, there's a trick to that in a sense that you want, you can place, uh, let's see, if I reverse, I'll do with the left hand here. I can place the bottom note of this chord, this D, so that at least I have that D anchored and then place two and one at the last minute as I do that little short roll, or maybe with this, this chord, if I'm not rolling, I still can place I can still place the fourth finger and have that be anchored. But I thought, wait, well, wait a minute, wait a minute. We're, we're, we've got these three sharps. There's lots of enharmonic possibilities available. What if there's an enharmonic we could use that would make this easier? So wait a minute, what about the making, instead of the F sharp, that this is a problem here. That collision there. What if I do a G flat? And if we go back, of course, the very beginning of the piece, it's all the same bar repeated. I'm not playing the G. Great. So then I could go playing a 
G flat instead of an F sharp. Ah, and here, this, while not as bad as the chords, is also a bit of a trouble spot if we're doing it as written because there's these notes that are quite close together, right? The, I mean, they're as close as they can be, the F and the E. And so, if I, there's a chance that I'll buzz as I, well, not at the moment, but as I go to place that F. Or, I'm not quite succeeding there, but I can pull this, this uh, string so firmly that it, that it, collides with the finger a little bit because they're so close together. So by playing the G flat instead, that, that becomes that much safer and cleaner. And then here, so, we haven't done anything with this A collision, and it is an A natural. We can't actually create, the only way we can get an A natural is with an A natural. So we can't do anything great with enharmonics there, but at least we've gotten rid of this F. So I think it, again, small difference. It doesn't necessarily make it easy, but I think it's a much better chance of having it be nice and clean. And then it just means we have to do a G sharp as well as this E sharp here. So I'll do the G sharp first and then change the E on the beat, whatever. This is just a little symbol to show that it's a two step pedal change. So my teacher always liked to do that and I, do that then as well because we see the G sharp and we know the G is going down but because it's in flat there's a chance we push it down one notch and end up with G natural instead of G sharp because we shortcut in our in our mind that oh yeah okay we're pushing the pedal down but we don't realize it's, it's a double down so or a double up sometimes right G sharp to G flat so I, I, I like to put that little symbol in there just as a reminder that it's a two-step pedal change so anyway, so I'm really happy and excited about that. I, I, again, I just discovered that today. I'll play around with it some more, but I think it's gonna make that section just that much more reliable. Um, and again, the choir is singing away and blah, 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 but you know, everything we can do to make it nice and clean is great. Um, uh, one other spot in Welcome You All, which is just the timing of this pedal change. So originally, probably in that episode, that first episode, I probably had the B flat here. You can kind of see on this scan, it's a little bit faint, but um, right on the beat, which is typically how I would like to change it, right when it's needed. But what I would find is that it's fairly fast, right? We get... I, I don't know, sometimes I would just... I, it, the timing of that pedal change would maybe be a tiny bit late or whatever, and I would get some sound. Whereas we don't play a B for the longest time, right? Uh, so maybe not since these chords. So why not change it a little bit earlier? Change it. Oh, sorry. Uh, and that means that just the one E flat there and that E flat happens a little bit later in the at the, towards the end of the triplet. So um, anyway, for me, that's just made a difference in terms of it being safer. That was something I changed a number of years ago, but uh, I think different again from that first episode. Uh, ah, and then here in The Young and Child, I've just been playing around with, again this year, with taking a couple of these big chord, left-hand chord notes in the right hand. So what do we have here on the second page? We, um, we change our E to uh, natural. We have this chord here. 
And again, we're playing that low C. It's 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 not very clear, but uh, as a B sharp because we have a C sharp, which we're using to double the D flat C sharp. So it's a big left hand chord, but that's fine. Like I'm I'm okay with that. I, uh, I have time to set up for it, and my hands are, are quite comfortable with that. You, again, you might decide with small hands it might make sense to reach down and take that E with the fourth finger, but I'm keeping it all in, in the left hand at the moment. But here, with this chord, and I'm not quite sure why the A is circled in my from my scan, but it's it's not an enharmonic, it's an A natural, but the, the C, the top note, is a B sharp. So with this, to play this, coming from here, because of this big stretch, I have to pull that A quite a bit towards me, and the B is ringing, and I don't really want to muffle it. It always felt a bit risky finding that cleanly, so that, that time was okay, but uh, it's not always so good. So what I've been experimenting with is just taking that B with the right hand. And again, I have long arms, so reaching down that low in the right hand is fine. here but again this little bit so it's an E an A and a B sharp into this big A one five eight ten so I'm reaching down and trying to play that B quite loudly so there's a chance I actually push that string into the orbit of the A so, Even if I don't, it's hard not for it not to be boom, 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 for there to potentially be a bit of a pause instead of one, two, three, one. Mm. So I've been trying to play maybe the first two, the A and the E, with the left hand, and then four, three on B sharp, C, uh, C sharp. a bit risky trying to find that A with a B ring. And I may come up with some, some other option that, that I'm happier with, but I don't know, I kind of like that. There's just those two spots reaching down. This, of course, you know, is, is for a vocal soloist and harp, so it's you're quite exposed. And just to have it that extra reliability in terms of having it be really nice and clean, uh, I think is nice. And then the final one is number five, as due in April. So here, I can't remember what I said on that original episode, but I know when I learned it uh, that this this D flat, that's the same D flat the right hand is playing, I learned it not playing it. So going one, two, three. But these days, I, I use the C-sharp to make an enharmonic. I kind of assume that's what he wanted. It's actually easier, I think, to, to, to play all the notes instead of instead of 3, 2, 1, off, and then 1, 2, 3. Uh, I don't know. Yeah. So uh, anyway, I just thought I would mention that. And then, of course, we have to do an extra pedal change. And then here, towards the bottom of the page, so of course we're using an uh, D sharp in place of E flat, because we also have E natural right here. The right hand is, uh, this is this E flat, and here's this E natural, so we have to do something in terms of enharmonics. And so here, originally, what I had was the left thumb playing a D sharp. You can see it's circled in pencil there. So this is treble clef, remember. So that it would be And the 
problem is, if you think about two, no two strings right next to each other, if the lower note is with a thumb and the upper note is with a finger, you are... Both of them are having to sneak in to avoid buzzing on the other string, right? Because the thumb has to go in between the two strings and the finger has to go in between the two strings. If you reverse that, if you had a finger on the bottom note and a thumb on the top note, then there's, you know, you, neither hand is trying to go in between the strings, so it's much, potentially much cleaner. So that's what I've done here, that the right hand, instead of playing a root E chord, is playing like a G inversion, D, G, B, and the left thumb is playing the E flat sort of as written, so ignoring that and harmonic. So it becomes instead of I think this way even even if it's clean I'm often muffling that D sharp with the back of my finger as I place so that and here we hear that maybe a little bit more legato I think I I haven't messed around with trying to use maybe an F flat here on this next bar. Maybe I should. I'd, actually, I never thought of that because here we have, uh, sorry. Here we have this D sharp in the left hand, E natural in the right hand. Uh, what happens if I do do an F flat? So previous bar, we've, we've come up. camera no less um i think that yeah that that makes sense so again you know this is kind of maybe the general principle i want to offer here is that it can be easy to once you've learned a piece or as you're learning a piece to just follow what's written and try and do it well right and that is that can be a great mindset you know especially maybe as a student working with a teacher you're given some good set of fingerings and you just try and do it as well as you can. And if it doesn't sound good, you try to build your technique to the point where it does sound good. But then also, it can be so easy, and so especially with a piece you maybe played a long time or with a piece where you've been in that mindset of, okay, I just have to make it sound good, that to not maybe stop and think about, wait a minute, is there a better way to do that? And so, of course, if you get to the point where you're working on your own, tackling pieces where there's maybe no fingering, making your own arrangements, you have to be thinking about that. And so, yeah, here I never really then looked at this, this little section here, but if I do these as F flats, it makes this, you know, so D sharp here and an F flat here means that there is lots of room between them. Great. And the pedals work out fine. So here, on this little run, I just remember to do this, the E natural is an F flat, and then uh, I wouldn't need this. I can change back to F natural maybe. Um, oops, uh, and then, and then uh, no need to use an F flat here. So, cool, that's great. Yeah, so a, a, a perfect example of, of like, I, I never thought of that, but I think for sure using an F flat there sounds better. Um, and again, for me, with the size of my hands, uh, that that particular then configuration in this section works. Maybe it doesn't work for you. I don't know, but I think uh, definitely worth trying. And then at the end, ah, uh, just this little this little sort of um, parallel sixth for the most part, uh, one octave in there as well. Uh, this little double arpeggio on both hands. I can't remember if I did it this way back those years ago, but I've done it various different ways. But at the moment, I feel like I just want to do 4, 3, 2, 1, 3, 2, 1 in both hands. Sorry. Ra 
rather than rather than trying to do something like that, I'm, I'm actually pretty happy with my ability to to do a cross under arpeggio. Uh, and that's gotten better over the years, right? For, for me in terms of my technique. Um, but what I am doing then is I am doing, it's very messy here, but I am doing a couple of D sharps in the left hand instead of E flats. So right hand starting on this E flat, this way, both hands can be placed. Well, except for this G, sorry. But instead of having to go and then place the E now, I can have the second finger on that D already. And then I might as well use the D here as well. And it means the left hand feels like it's doing a G chord. Rather than... So this is with an E chord. And there's just a little bit more uh, stoppage because you were stopping this E string. And this E string rather than... So it maybe sounds a slightly better and maybe slightly easier to do the D sharp there. But again then, so for my hands, it's not all... Trying to do a one-handed arpeggio on the harp is not the most comfortable thing. Having to cross under and skip one string or having to cross under and skip uh, two strings is not particularly comfortable and so with this type of writing these kind of like parallel sixths in this case or whatever are not often the best sort of harp writing and so sometimes it does make sense to try and split the hands up in a different way but in this case I'm for me at least I'm happy just to do it as an arpeggio in both hands Ta -da. so that's it so just a few things but again uh, hopefully that's useful for you if you happen to be working on Ceremony of Carols and uh, maybe some one of these spots is something you haven't tried that particular approach to and maybe it works for you. Uh, but also, again, I think just this general idea of it can be really potentially useful to look at a piece you know well with fresh eyes as if you were approaching it for the first time or, or just to, if you're working on a piece you know well, to go back to that spot that you always feel is a bit risky or, or not as good as you would like and, and approach that with fresh eyes and what other solution could you come up with. So yeah, hope you've enjoyed that. I will see you soon for another episode of Harp Tuesday. Cheers.